right, hello, hello, my friends. Today is a very good day. We are going to be talking all about this beautiful Volvo P1800. So, let's do it. A very big thank you to the owner of this P1800, Daniel McKenna, for letting me make a video on his wonderful car. And also, if you're not familiar with this channel, it's all classic car content. If that's your cup of tea, go ahead and press the subscribe button. Now, as always, I like to paint a little picture of the times when a car comes out in the year. And sadly, what I'm about to say feels very pertinent to right now. All right, so it's 1961. The Cold War is still waging on. JFK has just been sworn as president. Following that, the failed attempt at overthrowing Castro with the Bay of Pigs. Russia has just put their first man, or the first man, into space. We would shortly follow along just a month later. The initial first concrete components of the Berlin Wall have just been erected. And, yeah, that's a lot, isn't it? I know. But on a much brighter note, this is also the first year that the beloved, and some would say one of the most beautiful cars ever made, the Jaguar E-Type, made its debut. I think it'll be fun to give you all varying views of our mechanic shop, while you also get different views of the P1800. All right, let's get back to our appropriate timeline. Now, the genesis of the P1800 is very similar to other sports cars of the day. You see, there was a major U.S. market for sports cars right after World War II. I actually just did, um, covered this, I covered this actually a lot in the radio show. Post-World War II, you had an influx of servicemen that had money, all right? An ungodly amount, a fabulous, I should say, a fabulous amount of sports cars came to the U.S. after World War II. Many of the European governments told their manufacturers, export or die. For instance, I think it's 80% of the Austin Healey 3000's production came to the U.S. That was a little bit of a digression, but that's okay. Now, the genesis of the Volvo P1800, well, Volvo saw an opportunity in the sports car market and wanted a little piece of it. And get this, they had actually already had a first attempt at a sports car coming out of Volvo. It was the P1900. Yeah, and the P1900 did not fare so well. Only 16, I'm sorry, only 68 of these cars were created. And the president of Volvo at the time, an, an Asar Gunnarsson? Gunnarsson? Gabrielson. Asar Gabrielson. Asar Gabrielson. I'm going to spell his name out here. Now, he was the one that pushed for this. You see, he had saw the Chevy Corvette and thought, Boy, there's our inspiration. With that inspiration, well, they also used fiberglass. And fiberglass takes some experience and skills, shall we say. The P1900 was super duper cute, all right? Frankly, I mean, it looked like a little kind of little Corvette, all right? It's a good looking car, but why did it fail? Well, if you're building a car out of fiberglass, well, then you also have to account for other ways to make it rigid, all right? Its actual end of the P1900 is kind of funny. See, then president, when they finally made the P1900, was a gentleman named Gunnar Ingaloo. All right, now the president goes out and takes the P1900 for a weekend drive. All right, the engineers are like, bye. You know, he comes back Monday and absolutely puts a stop to production. He tells engineers that he thought it was going to fall apart. And that was the end of the P1900. But good news, Volvo decided to try again. And at the helm of the wheel, they put a gentleman, Helmer Pedersen, to create the P1800. Now, interesting thing about Helmer Pedersen, he was the man behind the Volvo PV44, which helped assure Volvo's future during and post-World War II. So here's where things get just a little bit tricky in regards to the actual authorship or design of this design, all right? You see, Helmer Pedersen's son, Pell Pedersen, actually drew this up while he was under the tutelage of Carrozzeria Fru, Fru, Frua. I mean, I made it half that sentence almost there, so let's give me that. Carrozzeria Frua, all right, one of a so many famed Italian coat body designers in Turin, Italy. 
So really there is some kind of confusion about why that went on, all right? It was said that um, I, I, three, this is what my brother told me this morning when we were on the radio show, three different designs were handed to a voting board anonymously. And Pell Pedersen's was apparently the one that was picked. But the voting board didn't know that Pell Pedersen had put in his stuff. It was confusing. Well, it, I think the, the essence of the problem is that Volvo wanted to say that this was a body done in Turin, Italy. An Italian designed body. And if it was done by one of their own sons, then they couldn't really... <sighs> Anyways. Either way, the bottom line of the story is that not until 2009 did Volvo finally admit, or at least should I say, recognize Pell Pedersen for the authorship of this car's design. So, a little bit messy. But I will say this, Pell Pedersen did go on to be a hugely prolific yacht designer. All right, so enough of that interesting drama. Now, Volvo has situated an agreement with Carmen to manufacture the P1800. Okay, but there's going to be a twist. And Carrozzeria Frua has created three of the pro first prototypes. Helmer Pedersen drives to Frua, picks up the prototypes, drives to Carmen so that they can begin manufacturing. And you see, at this time point, engine, the, you know, Carmen is ready to manufacture. The engineers have been prepping. They are ready to go. Volvo is counting on them to produce this car. But now, nah, uh-uh. You know what's going to happen? A twist, all right? Volkswagen, who is the largest client of Carmen, realizes that this is probably going to be a major competitor for the Carmen Ghia, or just any of their other cars. And Volkswagen isn't putting up with any of it. They tell Carmen if they continue with the production of the Volvo P1800, then they are going to pull out entirely. So there's poor Helmer Pedersen outside of the Carmen manufacturing plant with one of the P1800 prototype just waiting. Now this almost completely nixed the P1800 from ever happening. Ooh, but there's a twist. You see, Helmer Pedersen wasn't gonna give up that soon on his baby. And he gathered two investors and went to Volvo, offered to buy the P1800 components for him to market and sell himself. But there's another twist, all right? Now, at this time, Volvo has never mentioned this car. Like nobody, unless you are in Volvo, Carmen, Frua, uh, you know, nobody really, in the, the general public in the press are not aware of this vehicle yet, okay? And Volvo's not responding back to Helmer Pedersen. And somebody leaks a photo of the vehicle to the press with a press release. And at this point, Volvo has to say something. They have to acknowledge the existence of this car. There's a photo. And with that, they go ahead and say, well, let's just figure out a way to manufacture it. And they worked out a deal with Jensen Automotive Manufacturing in the UK, which is why there's a lot of British in this car. In 1960, the P1800 made its grand debut at the Brussels Motor Show. And it was powered by the B18 straight four engine. B standing for benzene, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's a Swedish word, it means gasoline, and 18 for 1800cc displacement. Oh boy, now at this point, it feels like I've been talking a lot. Let's take a little spin around the car. I would say, hands down, in my opinion, top, top looks for Volvo. I mean, got to be the most beautiful car Volvo's ever made. It's got to be the car that most people have no idea Volvo made. I don't know. Let me know what you think. If you're watching this, you might already be into classic car content, but you task an average Joe what this is, they're not going to say Volvo. Volvo also got very lucky. It was right around this time that the a hit television, or soon-to-be hit television series, 
The Saint, starring Roger Moore. <gasps> yeah, that Roger Moore. Was looking for a vehicle for their main character, Simon Templar, played by Roger Moore, to drive. Now, Volvo wasn't their first car to ask. They actually asked Jaguar to have to donate two of their XKEs. We call them XKE. I mean, the states say XKE, but you, we have a little. Right over here is one of the E types. We just had a silver one leave the shop, which is good. But Jaguar declined. How lucky for Volvo was that? Because it gained serious notoriety. When I post a photo of this car or a video of this car on my Instagram, everybody mentions the same. All right, now like I already mentioned, Jensen was a UK-based automotive manufacturer, a British car maker, right? Now, that means that the P1800, there's a lot of, a lot of the UK in there. Now, eventually, Jensen did lose the contract, and that was in 1963. Volvo decided to go ahead and move the manufacturing back to Sweden, and that is when they put an S on the end of 1800 for the 1800S to denote that they were now manufacturing them in Sweden. And then three years, not three years, I can't do math. Seven years later, in 1970, we would have the 1800 E pop out. Now, what does the E stand for? Ein Spritzen. Ein Spritzen. Anyways, now what does that E stands for? Well, Ein Spritzen in German means fuel injection. And it is powered by Bosch D Jetronic fuel injection system, which I don't know if you can see the nose of my baby right here. Oh, let's just get closer. I'll just give you a little less. Now, my 912 E, the E stands for Einspritzen. Ta -da -da! That is going on, I don't know, that might be 15 or 18 years of a car restoration project. It's a little eerie how 14 year old Caitlin looks a lot like 30 something year old Caitlin. <laughs> That is what the E stands for. Now, the top speed of the car was 118 miles per hour, which was kind of fast back then. And fortunately, it also was the first of the 1800 series to feature four-wheel disc brakes. And then in 1972, we would see the final P1800 variant from Volvo, the 1800 ES. Ooh. The most beautiful station wagon? I don't know, you let me know. You let me know what you think. A glorious two-door station wagon with an all-glass tailgate. Literally, though, is that not glorious? If you have one for sale, email me at thebadblondcars at gmail.com. Only like a smidge over 8,000 of the 1800 ES were ever created in the two years of their production, but they did have a lasting influence. The all-glass tailgate of the ES models proved very, very popular, and they had a lasting influence on Volvo design. I don't know why I do this to myself, but I can't even help it. All right, now, because of the unusual design of the glass tailgate of the 1800 ES, well, it kind of earned a few funny nicknames in Germany and in Sweden, all right? Like the Fiskbillen, which meant fish coffin or fish basket. Fish box. It means fish box. And then the Schnee Witchen Scharg in German, which means Snow White's coffin. I know I brutalized those two words, but at least I can say I tried. And then in 1973, we would see the final year of production for the 1800 line. They did pretty good, all right? From 1963 to 1970, no, I've got my. From 1961 to 1973, they produced 47,492 units. And I can't help but think, what if Volvo had continued in this realm of design, right? I mean, yes, they're known for, I mean, anybody that grew up uh, in the 80s and 90s, you were probably in a very square Volvo, right? It's just interesting to think that what if they carried more than just the glass tailgate design into the future of Volvo designs. What is your favorite Volvo? Before seeing this video, did you know about the P1800? Curious to hear. Have you ever watched the show The Saint? Is there any car you see in the background that I should do a video on? 
there's a lot. And if you like classic cars as much as I do, then you can press the subscribe button, which is somewhere down here. All right, guys, I hope you had as much fun as I do because this is my little piece of paradise. This is our mechanic shop. My dad started it over 40 years. Been blessed to be a mechanic's daughter, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.